Yeah. All right. Then welcome again, Veronica, and please. Cool. Okay. So, by the way, now that we have a Slack channel, if you have any questions, you can always place them there and I have a look at, at the end of the lecture. Okay. So, maybe it's easier than, you know, telling to Claudius, Claudius sends to me. You can always write it here and I'll answer the questions. So, last time in the first lecture, we talked about recurrent neural networks. We talk about um, implementations uh, a, bit, a bit more complicated that took into account um, a local but beyond local uh, uh, relations among sequential data. And then we ended up with the LSTM, which as I told you, is just a complicated uh, or a more complicated version of a recurrent unit. Uh, where you have several gates. Okay, so remember, it's something like uh, the idea is we are going to be entering some sequential data, some point T. Um, we are going to use as parameters that are varying in the case of the LSTMs, um, a cell memory and an activation. And we are going to combine this in complicated ways with three gates and stuff and so on in order to maybe uh, produce a prediction for this time t or not, depending on the task we have at hand and get out of this, the next step, cell memory and the activation, AT. And the idea is that by combining things like this all together, we are going to be able to describe a sequential data and try to produce predictions and so on. Okay, and um, before we had neural networks to do this kind of task, of course, there are many different um, techniques that have been applied mathematically to time series in order to predict. So given some past, can I predict the future evolution of some variable or set of variables? Um, by the time these guys appear, the most, uh, say, prevalent uh, method for time series was ARIMA. ARIMA was like the standard, gold standard of a, a time series. So I wanted to show you what uh, ARIMA, at least a bit of what ARIMA is about. And in particular, ARIMA is a just autoregressive integrated moving average model. Essentially, it takes into account uh, the dependencies uh, of uh, the observation and a number of lag observations. Essentially, it takes the time series and it sees and tries to find in this autoregression some kind of patterns that are temporal that maybe they are repeating. Uh, integrated because they try to find if the time series is stationary or the properties of the time series. And the moving average is just uh, in order to produce future predictions, is looking at past predictions, but also doing averages among these predictions. So it's not just the last step, but some average. To tell you the truth, uh, implementing ARIMA is a bit cumbersome. And in fact, in the notebook I'm sharing with you here, um, uh, I had this um, first steps that you will do for ARIMA. For example, you will start computing things like the rolling mean, the standard deviation. You will see whether, um, for example, this ADF statistics. I'm not going to enter into ARIMA because we are not going to use it, but you start seeing whether uh, your time series is really stationary or not. And depending on that, in this case, our time series is quite stationary because these values are close to these other values. And then you apply or not a RIMA and whatever. So it's, it's a, it's a story by itself. And it was the standard until the neural networks came in. And as soon as, you know, recurrent neural networks were in and uh, by the direction of recurrent networks were in, then, uh, they were performing better than ARIMA. But I wanted to tell you that the LSTMs, that the ones that I'm giving you as example uh, for forecasting time series are much better than ARIMA. So ARIMA is complicated because you have to implement uh, all these uh, properties of your time series. And then essentially you have three parameters, P, Q, and D. 
PQ, no, PDIQ, sorry. And then uh, numerically try to find the best value for this P, D, and Q. Um, for the, of course, neural networks are computationally expensive, but uh, you set them up. There are already lots of libraries that have you do this in PyTorch or in TensorFlow. You run it, and uh, if you run my notebook, you see that an LSTM takes time, but you know the 2000 epochs happen in a matter of minutes. So, the you look here, for example, in this paper, they did this um, comparison for many types of time series, for example, stock price, transportation use, housing, dollar exchange rate, a, a set of different um, types of uh, time series, and they compare the best they could do with ARIMA with the LSTM. And in all cases, they found an um, improvement on the error rate of 85% or something, 84, 85%. The bottom line is that if you can use LSTMs for your time series, you, are, you can do very well. What are the limitations? Well, like everything else, right? If your data is, you don't have a lot of data, for example, or your data is very noisy, just using blind box LSTMs might not be the best good step to, to do it first. As usual, whenever you are encountering a new data set, a realistic data set, uh, you have to look at it, look for outliers, do a kind of checks that uh, you will do in real life. That's something I wanted to tell you. I, I know, I don't know, unfortunately, I don't know you guys there. I imagine you are all the students, uh, some from theory, some of them experiments at different levels of uh, seniority inside your PhD, or even people that have already a PhD. And um, I guess uh, in physics, we are used to in practical physics to know what we are looking at, right? We are very used to have a Monte Carlo where we can generate as many examples as we want. We already have a very good idea of uh, what we are looking for because we have been, you know, uh, following this path for many, many years. So um, neural networks give us this S extra epsilon, right? Um, the problem is that when you encounter real life uh, data, let's say you work in the private sector, in my case, when I work with data sets that come from other areas, let's say, I'll, I will I'll tell you tomorrow about this, uh, for example, ecology or uh, sandstorms, the thing I was telling you about, or traffic or pollution or stuff like this. These are real data sets that, you know, suffer all kinds of problems, like um, there are problems because there are periods where the data taking is wrong or their values are completely wrong or you have to do interpolations and so on. Those are the kind of problems that you, I will call them real life, that you will have to encounter. Uh, and, and particle physics, we are a bit pampered with the fact that we know the theory or we have a very good idea of the theory. We can generate events because we can simulate the stuff. We know the theory behind. And this is not the case for most areas in science. So keep that in mind that, of course, you have a good data set. And this, uh, we have been you know, collecting data about all kinds of things, stock prices or transportation use. We have the ability to take data in real life. And uh, that long historical series, then of course we can do a good analysis and the neural networks are going to be helpful. But this might not be the case. And sometimes in the future, you might encounter a situation where you had to go back one step, do a RIMA or even something very much more simple than a RIMA, things that are less complicated simply because your data is not as, as good. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, so that's a RIMA. And the bottom line is that for most applications you will use, you, you want to go for LSTM or something more complicated to really squeeze the last drops, okay? So we discussed about this more traditional heuristic ways of dealing with data, that's ARIMA. Um, and now what I want to tell you is, okay, so once you have a, a time series, you run, let's say, a simple LSTM, and this is something that uh, I share with you in the notebook, for example, here. We run this simple LSTM for our magnetic field, and what I was showing you here is blue is the reality and red and green is the prediction. This is for one run of my LSTM, of my neural network, and 
like everything in particle physics, we want to estimate uncertainties. So we are going to spend a bit of time talking about uncertainties and how people do deal with them in, uh, in the case of uh, time series. And I'm sure many of the concepts are already something you know about, but maybe not in the context of, of uh, time series, okay? All right, so how do we estimate uncertainties? So usually, uh, let's say that I'm, uh, I have a um, data set. I don't need to explain this, but I'm going to say it. Usually you think about your statistical uncertainties and also probably your systematic uncertainties. So the statistical, um, I say, is related to the fact that I have a finite data set and, and you will estimate if you didn't do anything, no, no kind of a more complicated is treatment, you will say that there is like a square root of n error bars, more or less. So if I have a small data set, uh, I'm going to have an error that is large and is more or less a square root of n, more or less, depending on the situation. And the systematic, as you know, is this kind of error bars that had to do with our inherent inability to measure things to 100% accuracy. So when it's not just that we don't have enough data or the data set is finite, but also each measurements, measurement inside this data set, they all have their own uh, uh, systematic uncertainties. And the experimentalists in the audience must be super fed up with this because uh, uh, I know you guys spend a lot of your, your life <laughs> estimating like hundreds of uncertainties in order to get out any kind of results from the LHC. I know this is this is tough and you are probably fed up with it. But I, I can tell you when it comes to a time series, and when it comes to applications beyond particle physics, life is much easier. And it's much easier simply because uh, the state of the art in other areas is different, is much, uh, let's say, less sophisticated. I'm going to give you an example. So coming back to this story of the sandstorms, this project that I work on, uh, we were comparing our method uh, with other methods in the literature. And uh, for example, for each of these sandstorms, these T1 to T17 are historical storms. Some of them were extremely powerful. And uh, one of them that is called the Halloween storm was the one that shut down parts of Canada and so on. We are talking about things that are pretty, pretty powerful. So we started them and see how well we can uh, kind of predict the storm is set. This is the, the the strength of the storm and how it's going up and down and up again and so on. But um, what we had to compare with in terms of deep learning models, there were not that many studies using deep learning, only these three. And in all these studies, these people that are essentially geophysicists working with uh, data science people, informatics and so on, all what they had done was to build an architecture. They were running uh, this architecture at this time series. They were optimizing a tiny bit by hand, not even using Optune or some good optimizer. And then from all the runs they were doing, like 10, 20 or whatever, they were choosing the best value for each of these parameters. For example, this is the root mean square error or R square. And uh, so each of these guys, Siciliano, Collado, y Young, they, they were giving predictions for each of these storms and how well they, they will be measuring them. Uh, so the larger the value, the, the worse you are doing. And uh, they were simply given, uh, quoting the best value of all the runs. So they were running the, the neural network many times and the, the dots and stars, and the values they are quoting are always the best value. With no uncertainty, nothing whatsoever. And that's, that is a state of the art. Those papers are published in the best uh, journals of space weather. Okay, so just to tell you that uh, in particle physics, particularly in experimental particle physics, you guys are really like what? Well, 
making the best use you can of your data and making super sure what you are saying, no? To really extract the few drops. We can do that because we know the theory behind. We can run Monte Carlo, as I said, we can compare with the stuff. We have a good idea of what we need to get. So there's this, I, just to give you a, like a view, is this um, in, in our area, this ability to go much beyond in terms of um, uncertainty estimation and so on, but it's because we know the theory. So we are lucky in that sense. In other areas in science, this is not the case. People don't know what is the theory behind this. They don't know. Uh, they have um, qualitative ideas of what is the onset of a storm, uh, but it's complex phenomena. So the, all what they do is modeling. And they don't have, uh, let's say, the, the, the will or the understanding in able to do anything better than just, for example, in this case, quoting the best value. So uh, in our case, what we did was to actually run uh, doing bootstrap and so on. I'm going to tell you about bootstrap because this is the kind of thing you can do for time series and then estimate the error bars. And of course, they, once you start estimating the error bars, you see that, uh, you know, uh, yep. things... Be, yeah? We have a question. Uh, ah, great. Uh, okay. Uh, I know like some uh, modeling for biophysics and uh, they also do with uh, time series. And I know that uh, sometimes they build their model and they can uh, do uncertainty or something like that as far as I can tell. But I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm not in the field, but uh, could you explain a little bit more about it? Because then uh, with the example from biophysics that I know, for example, they are trying to uh, model how uh, act, uh, some specific characters uh, populated some specific area, and they uh, try to uh, use data they they had and try mm. to see how it was changing from the model they used. So this is one example that I don't know if it is uh, applicable for what you're saying about uncertainties. That's why I'm like. Uh, maybe I'm not getting the point that you're saying. Could you explain a little bit better? Sure. Um, so one thing is the in biophysics and many other scientific areas, um, the use of statistics is very, like people know about the statistics and they do statistics very well. So I'm not saying they don't do it right. And I'm uh, referring right now about the use of deep learning. Okay. Okay, and yes, in in particular, for example, I work with these people in ecology. What they do is to look at um, ecological interactions, and they they use statistics a lot um, in, in ways that, uh, as a physicist, you are like, what? Uh, that sometimes, like, essentially, because they use a lot R as a computing language. Uh, and there are all these um, uh, libraries, like in Cyp SciPy. There are all these libraries of things you can compute, like t-test and so on. They do this a lot, and sometimes you wonder if this is really just because you, you can get it out of the box or it really makes sense. So uh, one thing I will tell you uh, is that if you go to another area or you talk or work with people in other areas, they might be doing statistics in a way that uh, is a bit out of the box. Uh, because it's simply what they, they learn how to use. And sometimes these things don't make sense. But yeah, biophysics, um, you know, they, in the undergrad, they get all these good courses on the statistics, very good. So here I'm referring about deep learning. For this area and many other areas beyond particle physics, uh, you are going in science, not in computer science, of course, you are going to find that deep learning is like a new thing. And as the first uh, things they do, they don't think, for example, on uncertainties. And I'm just giving you this example where we go um, work in this area and we had to compare with existing literature that again is published in the best journals and so on. And the existing literature is using uh, the deep learning methods in a way that is just out of the box and uh, with no uncertainty estimation and so on. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's bad. It means that it's an opportunity. It's the normal thing. You start using a tool for the first time, 
uh, you get results that are wonderful and much better than, <clears throat> like for example, Arima, I was telling you, no? people who have been using Arima, evaluating uh, all kinds of percentages and so on in time series, then you do an LSTM and then your, your error bars plummet, right? Go down, like mm -hmm. incredible. Then, of course, you don't need to, you know, do too much uh, beyond that. So it's just saying that this is uh, many areas beyond particle physics uh, starting to use deep learning and um, uh, they don't have the level of sophistication that we apply to our area. And that's good. It means that we have a, ch a chance to contribute if, or to help if we want to. Okay. So. No, thank you for putting this out. It's indeed, uh, you see in uh, many areas that uh, they do very sophisticated statistical tests with very small data sets. And you are like, uh, this is not the case of biophysics, probably. So I'm going to be telling you a couple of uh, possible evaluations of uh, uncertainties. You have heard about them, I'm sure, in the context of particle physics. I'm going to explain a bit and then say how you would use them or one way of using them for time series. One is k folkers validation and the other is bootstrap. So let's start with the uh, cross validation. Let me start over, yeah. So both cross validation and bootstrap are what is called resampling methods. Essentially, you have uh, your data set. Imagine your data set is, a, of course, a set of points. And I'm going to do, try to evaluate the, once I run my algorithm, or even before running my algorithm, I'm going to be resampling in my data set as a way of estimating uncertainties in my predictions. And these uncertainties may be related to both the performance of the algorithm itself, the predictions it gives, but also of the fact that my data set is finite and I'm only seeing part of it. So I have a finite data set. Again, the, oh, I know you guys know about this a lot, but uh, let's, let's talk about this a bit more. So k fold cross-validation, the idea is that uh, from my sample, I'm going to choose k elements of my sample. I'm going to divide my sample in, in uh, collecting k elements every time. So for example, in the case of the uh, sandstorms, all my storms, I have 17 storms. They are, it's important to keep the structure because this is a time series of each storm. The storms look like this. So each of them look like a, some sudden up and down and uh, lots of variations. And then it goes back to normal. This is a storm. So when I going to take my data set, which is a bunch of evolution over these 17 storms, I need to make sure that I um, keep the structure of the storm. So it's not just simply collecting uh, points in, in this data set. I need to keep the structure. So cross validation in this case means when I'm going to train my algorithm, uh, I could choose a number of storms, 20 storms in this case, for training, five storms for validation, and 70 storms for test. Right? That's what the other words had done, the ones we were comparing with. But uh, it means that uh, when you produce your predictions and you assign an error bar to these predictions, they are going to be based on this particular sampling, where this is the training, the validation, and the test. So a way of testing the robustness of your method is precisely start moving things around. So you choose storms and you change, I know this is obvious, but you could start, uh, for example, using the some of the stones that were for training, for test, uh, same for the test and training, validation, and so on. So you can start sliding things and do this many times. So this will be, in this case, the implementation of k cross validation. Whereas in particle physics, we often deal with events 
and there is no, there are no sequences. Uh, they, uh, you simply have a one event, the another event, and as, as you do collisions. So the order itself is not important. And the sequence itself, there are no blocks or sequences. In this case, we had to keep this structure. So each of these blocks over here is one of these storms, right? In this case, it's the 17 storms. And we had to keep that structure because the, we need to understand the whole, sorry, evolution of the storm. We need the whole structure as a block. So when you do cross-validation, you are not just going to simply move things around in whatever way you want. You have to do it keeping this structure in some way. So this is a way to implement k cross validation. So imagine you have a, a, any other time data set. Um, what would you do in this case? So you will do k cross validation, but the structure you will keep is that you will take your time series. Uh, you will keep the structure of, if you are going to train your model with a given look forward and look back. So let me go back here and, and write it down. So let's say that my training is going to have our TIs, um, um, examples of some look uh, backwards and look forward. So I'm going to look at this and then try to predict the next steps. Right, so it's my block in my time series. I'm going to be separating my time series as some uh, steps of look back and then try to predict the look forward. And of course, I can do it here. I can do it, I can do it in many times, but I always need to, when I do cross, k fold cross validation, I need to keep these as blocks. So it's a bit different from what you will do in particle physics most of the time, which is you pick up any events, you back them whatever way you want, because in fact, the fact that you measure one event and then the other and so on, they, they, there's no time correlation there, but here there is. And in order to keep, in order to evaluate the robustness of your prediction or your algorithm that is based on doing some kind of bugging uh, and some look back and look forward are chosen, then you need to do k-fold in that way. Okay, so that's uh, for k-fold. This is again, uh, as you can imagine, there are many different ways to change this and to make it more Veronica, sophisticated. Do you have a question? Sure, uh, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so can you clarify it because I'm a little confused. So like this, uh, Cross validation is done. Um, is it done between different samples of that, and each sample is time series, or is it done between the, like a uh, different uh, pieces of the same time series? A different pieces of the same time series. So let me go here. Uh, let's say that you start with this. Uh, this is this is your time series, which in our case is different storms that happen at different moments in different years. So each of these blocks are actually time series that are not continuously connected. So you see that here there are a little bit of subtleties. So you had in total that many storms, 25 plus 17. And let's say you want to train an LSTM. You are going to take a sample for training another for validation and another for test. No, That's what you will do usually in, in machine learning. So let's say that you train, you do your optimization of parameters, blah, 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 and you get the best you can in your algorithm with this choice of training, validation, and test. So each so, storm uh, is a separate time series that is exactly. pieces, but they are all aligned in one big time series. So the way the LSTM is seeing them is indeed for the training. They are all aligned as a time series. They are not labeled. The, the label of uh, this is uh, storm one, two, or three. This is not seen by the LSTM. This is the LSTM is just look inside this storm. It's just looking in some uh, look back and then predict and look forward. And uh, so let's go back here. 
the idea is that you have a, let's say, a storm like this, that's T1, a storm like this, that's T2, and so on and so forth. And uh, for the LSTM, what we are going to input is a bunch of loopback for uh, as data, and it's going to predict a look forward. And then you will do the same, and you, you are separating your storm in chunks of loopback and predicting look forward. And then we do the same for the next storm, and the same for the next storm, and then we place all this XT, which are chunks of look back to then predict the look forward. Uh, and that's what we input in the LSTM. So indeed, this storm happened some year. This other storm happened another year. They are not uh, continuously connected. That's not happened. But the way you are giving the LSTM the information is this way. So you are giving from the storm chunks of the storm from this, this and other storm, also chunks of this storm, and so on and so forth, until you fill the whole data set for training. Okay. Is this clear? Mm -hmm. So it's not like the usual, indeed, that's why I wanted to show you. It's a, a non-trivial case. Uh, usually when you see a time series, it's continuous, let's say stock prices. There are no like chunks where, where things disappear. Uh, you have continuously every day uh, except in the weekends, you have a continuous evolution of your or your series or pollution. You have again something continuous. But uh, in this case, in the case of the storms, you still want to learn the features of your storms. It's just that they happen rarely. Every uh, sun cycle, when there is a loss of sun activity, storms are going to happen, and some will be very strong. Some they will not be very strong, and uh, so it becomes a bit more complicated. But yeah. Very good question. Indeed, that's the way we enter the data. And then the cost validation is simply, we do exactly the same, but we, we slide the choices of training and test and validation, which makes sense, no? Essentially for, if we just did this and did our best, uh, we, the LSTM will only be seeing this type of storms. And what about in this storm over here in the test, there was something interesting a feature that the LSTM could pick up uh, more clearly than in the training. We don't know that. As you can imagine, this this stuff is it's not like something humans can understand. And I can tell you, I work with the geophysicists that have been working on this for 20 or more years, and they still don't know how to characterize a storm. They just try to kind of uh, guess there is some sudden change and an onset, and, but this doesn't work all the time. There is no qualitative understanding, unfortunately. So the that's why deep learning is interesting because it seems to be understanding things, uh, understanding quote unquote, uh, and being able to predict much better than anything else that they have tried. So they, there is something there to understand and that's our next step with this group. But first thing we had to do is to at least check the robustness of our predictions. And the first thing you will do is once you have trained is to shuffle the different objects that you use for training, validation and test. That's one possibility. And then you see how robust your algorithm is. Any more questions on that? No, uh, then I'll go to the next thing, which is a uh, bootstrap. So we've been talking about once I train my algorithm, I'm going to check the robustness of their predictions. But how can I also uh, take into account that my data set is finite and might not be fully representative of the whole uh, uh, type of behavior I could have? You will say, okay, that's why I have a test set that is an unseen data and I see how well it performs on unseen, out of the distribution. Yes, that's true. But uh, point by point, you can also uh, uh, kind of assign an error bar to your uh, algorithm or to the predictions of your algorithm due to this final data set. And that's using re uh, Bootstrap, which I, I guess many of you guys have used. So it's not like it's going to be news, but I'm going to explain it a bit again, the concept, and then say how you do it for time series. So bootstrap, 
I should tell you that Bootstrap is really cool for error estimation in, in deep learning simply because you can always do it, always. So you, as soon as you have a data set, you run your algorithm and you can always do Bootstrap. So it's something that it doesn't require a lot of thinking. There is, of course, a library that you can just call and then do Bootstrap on it. And the understanding of Bootstrap is um, a quite intuitive. It goes along the stuff we do in particle physics. So just telling you that this is always the first thing I do when I want to do error estimation. So is the idea of Bootstrap. Uh, it's also called bugging. And uh, as you can imagine, it's simply have a data set of many points. And I'm going to just draw from this data set a bag of uh, a smaller amount of these, uh, of these events, right? And then on this data set that is smaller, on this bag, I'm going to run my predictions. And I'm going to do this many, many times. So I'm going to draw many of these smaller samples or bags of my full sample. And I'm going to um, estimate my error bars by simply looking at the variance or the deviations that I see as I apply my algorithm to different types of, uh, of subsets of data. So it's as simple as that, okay? So this is, gives you a kind of uh, feeling or you can estimate then um, how much of your predictions is biased from having this particular data set because you are just taking smaller samples you know, and then you can do this as many times as you want and you can see how much your mean prediction varies because you have a, a finite amount of data set. So of course you have a bunch of data and it's perfect. No matter how many smaller bugs I get, I'm going to get predictions that are very robust. But if my algorithm is not that great, uh, there is a lot of variance inside my data, or for example, there are lots of uh, um, systematics inside the data. I'm going to say, see the, how Bootstrap feels that and increases its, uh, its variance over there. So uh, Bootstrap is also nice because you do this uh, uh, drawing from the main distribution without replacement. And what it means by, sorry, with replacement, uh, you probably, we, as soon as you do bootstrap, you will hear about this with replacement. All what it means is that whenever I draw some data, uh, I get sample one, sample two, sample three, sample four, and I many I, you want. Generally, you do 10, 100 or something to estimate the error variable here. So every time I draw the data, I do it in the initial data sample. So if in the first bag, I have element, let's say A, the second time I draw the data, A is still in the data set. So what in, I don't know if this is clear, but so I'm going to be drawing from the full data set. And uh, the fact that once I draw A, doesn't mean that I'm going to not be in seeing A again. I'm not re taking off A of my sample in the next iteration. I'm actually putting it back and being able to obtain it again. So A, element A, can appear as many times as the drawing uh, takes it. So there is with replacement means that you take A here and you replace it. And in the next draw, you can take A again. We have a question, Veronica? Yeah. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so uh, usually when you have a finite when you have a finite data set, but if you make it smaller, uh, then usually your method is not going to perform as well. Uh, yes, so, in the yeah. So if, when you do this many times and you get some type of variance, but is there any way to account for the fact that uh, like when you run the is on your like large data set, you would usually get like a better result? In, if I, I didn't hear the last part, but if I understand correctly, you're saying, of course, like uh, if I take a smaller data set for testing, eh? I'm not saying for, for training. Uh, so you take the full data set. Mm. Mm. You train on the full data set or your training data set. And then for, for the testing, you are going to, instead of just doing the full uh, 
test data set, you are going to take bags. And then for that, you are going to get then your mean uh, prediction on your unseen data, but also a type of variance that has to do with the fact that your, your um, algorithm might be good at the training data set, but in the test, there's going to be variance over here. And I agree, there are limitations because if you take a bug in that with bugs that are very small, you are going to get a huge, uh, in principle, every of them might have a huge variation, but if you, and that's where the point I wanted to get to, because you do replacement, you can draw as many times, in, in principle, an infinite amount of times, any bugs you want. So at the end, the things are going to converge into their real variability. So bootstrap is good because you can always do it and you can do it as many times as you want. Uh, at some point, of course, if you do go, you draw a hundred times, uh, you will get some, some uh, picture of what's going on. If you draw 200 times or 500 times, the picture is going to stabilize and there will be no point of uh, keep bugging the data. So bootstrap is uh, just saying for me at least in applications it's, it's been like the simplest thing to evaluate some uncertainties out of the box. There are other methods. Yes, there are many other methods. Uh, for example, dropout is another method you could use to try to estimate the variance that is inside your data set and that your algorithm is going to perform not so well Right, or you want to estimate, given an algorithm, how well it's performing on your data set because the data set itself is has bias. Um, cool. So yeah, we have another question. Cool. Uh, yeah. Can you understand me? Okay, uh, I didn't fully understand how bootstrapping relates to this um, claim test validation step. Is the the big um, circle that it has this faster test? Set, or is it the full data set? Ah, very good. So for the moment, yeah, I wasn't clear. I'm talking about bootstrap in general, uh, like the thing you can do in general. Now to do bootstrap it in time series, which I think it was is what you're asking about, no? How do you actually do this in our case where we have a time series and we actually care about the, you know, you have a data set we care about the relations, the local relations over here. So I was talking so far about bootstrap in general, let's say the bootstrap you will do with your LAC events. If you have an algorithm and you have an algorithm, let's say to pick up on electrons or uh, boosted tops or whatever, uh, you could on your predictions, on your algorithm, you could do bootstrap and um, produce an error bar. This you can always do. Um, but in time series, things change a bit, of course, because I cannot just draw from the sample whatever time event I want. And it's again going to the same idea as uh, cross validation. For time series, cross validation needs to be done uh, protecting the structure of look back and look forward uh, the blocks that you use to feed the LSTM or whatever other neural network that predicts the, the structured time series. So same goes here. For time series, if you do bootstrap, it has to be block, boost, uh, block bootstrap. And the idea is that now your data set, instead of being just every time uh, step, you are going to have blocks of look back and then to be able to predict look forward. And that's the sample you are going to be drawing from. Okay, so it's um, in the case of the storms, same story. Uh, this A, B, C, D, let's say, that where we are going to do bootstrap samples and then we are going to evaluate our algorithm performance. Do, uh, each of these elements is actually a block of a, a time series, a mini time series inside the whole time series. Is this clear to, to the student? Uh, it's not exactly what I was asked about. Ah, yeah. Um, can you go back to the other side? To this, um, 
Ah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so we have the, the, the big survey that we had. Like I was wondering whether this is actually the, the full data set, or whether you only reserve half of the data for the final validation. I think because you will always only get a subset. You will always have some events that you did not see during the training. So I was imagining that maybe you could actually use the full set for for your testing then. Very good question. So, so yes, usually bootstrap, you will do it in this context in the test, in the unseen data. But uh, you see, uh, what you are saying is I could do bootstrap also on the training data because I'm bugging it in a different way. So I could use it as well. I agree. And that's why I'm saying uh, I'm telling you the simplest version. But there are many types of, especially for time series, ways of making those choices. Uh, there is only not one way of doing bootstrap. There are many. The simplest one is in your predictions, so in your test data, uh, do bugging. And then uh, when once you plot the, the data, and this is what we have done here, this is this storm is part of my, my test data set. So the algorithm didn't see it. And what we are producing here is the blue is the real uh, values the, of the test data. The red over here is the mean prediction when we do bootstrapping. And this is the area of the 95% confidence level. And we had run, for example, 200 bootstraps. So from this test, part of my test data set, uh, I've been uh, drawing blocks or samples uh, 200 times and then evaluating the mean and the, the average prediction, the, the error bar of the prediction. But uh, as you, you're saying, I'm resampling, and that allows me to, to, to find whether my algorithm is robust or not. I could do it in the, as well in part of the training data. You could do it as well. That's not, as far as I know, the usual thing. That's not what we do usually. But think that for a resampling you, in your training, you have the K4 cross validation. Like this is really for when you are going to train before you set your algorithm. This is the kind of thing you will do to check the, the robustness. So here you indeed are changing the training. Here I'm talking about just about the test. I don't know if this time more or less answer. Yeah, so, so we're talking about bootstrap. Uh, that's something you can do, uh, for example, in your test data. Once you draw your predictions from an algorithm, you train and do your best and optimize as much as you want, spend all the time you want, then you produce the, the predictions. And um, if you know what happens that, uh, of course, every time you produce predictions from a neural network, you are going to have there are some, essentially, once you train your algorithm, you have a frozen a set of predictions that takes inputs and produce outputs. What are the inputs? The look back. Where are the outputs? The look forward predictions in time. So your, once your algorithm is set, even if it has some random variables that can you know, go up and down, you can do things to estimate the uh, uncertainty in your algorithm by varying a bit your weights and your biases. But if you don't do it, essentially, your predictions are going to be set. Given my test data set, I'm going to have a prediction. So what Bootstrap allows you is to um, uh, produce at least an estimate on the uncertainty of your predictions from the algorithm that comes from resampling on the testing data itself. And that's what these error bars here appear. So this is um, good because you, for example, see this is the, let's say, the strength of my storm. The, the storm takes many minutes, as you can see, many days, sometimes days of a storm, electromagnetic storm, at least hours. And when you look at the whole storm, it looks like my algorithm is doing super well, no? Like I can barely distinguish the blue from the red. And that's what you will get if you do a time series and you just look at a long period of time, you are going to see that indeed uh, it looks like it's performing super well, uh, just by eye, a human eye, I mean. But then if you do a zoom, 
let's say this is the same, but zoom into a smaller period of time, more closer to, for example, the first dip of the storm, you see that uh, your predictions, the red and the reality, tend to be a bit shifted. And that's a, the typical behavior that you will expect in these neural networks. When you do time series and you, you train your neural network, uh, the neural network, if it doesn't have enough time for training, not enough epochs, not enough data, too complicated, the patterns or whatever, what is going to happen is, let me show you here that is more clear, is that uh, if you have some time series, the neural network might, at the beginning, simply predict the previous step. So let's say if I have a block of 10 minutes and I'm asking the next five minutes, the prediction for the next five minutes may be simply set to be the previous uh, block. So the previous seen data. I don't know if I'm clear with this. So um, let's say this is the real-time series. I train a whole LSTM and super complicated stuff. And it looks like it's performing very well because I'm looking at a very long time series. But when I zoom in, I realize that actually my neural network is taking the last prediction, or the last, sorry, point that are given, the last point in the look back, and is giving it as the prediction for the look forward. I'm telling you this because that's the typical thing you will uh, obtain at the beginning when you run any time series for not long enough or if your data is too complicated. So that's something to look for is that uh, this, this means no, here is learning something. For example, it's not learning uh, peaks and so on, but this situation tells you that the neural network is actually not learning the time series. It's simply taking the last point that uh, is be given and putting it forward, okay? I don't know if this, this is clear to you guys. If not, please ask. So this is what happens, of course, once you start training properly, uh, you will see that this shift uh, disappears and the closer as you get more and more training, this uh, point over here, this orange line is going to become closer and closer to the blue line until you actually predict the series. And that's the situation here. After training and more data, more careful analysis, you get something like this. So uh, keep an eye on the zooming into the data because, for example, for the storms, there is something more complicated. You see that uh, there is a still some shift uh, left. So the training is the best it can do, but uh, there is still, for example, you see here, um, this kind of behavior where this is the real is predicting the next step and it's quite close to the to the last step. This shift over here is a sign that the learning is not perfect, that you're not learning the whole data set. So you have to go and check that uh, what is your look forward and see that it's not simply pushing it to the next, uh, let's say if I'm taking 24 hours and predicting the next hour, I need to make sure that this shift is smaller than the one hour in order to see, assess that I'm really learning something. And this is something that if you just plot the RMSC, the root mean square error, you might not see uh, because simply, you know, things are, even if they are very abrupt and even if you are bad by one hour, when you average over the whole time series, you might think that you are doing very well, but actually your neural network is simply uh, not learning anything. Well, learning that uh, in order to produce more or less good results, it just needs to, to give us prediction, the last point that is given. Is this, uh, if it's not clear, please let me know. It's an important point uh, to keep an eye when with time series. So this is about the shift, uh, the learning on long learning. And this is something that uh, always zooming in is important and something to check by eye, even if your, your uh, accuracy seems to be very good and so on. But now going back to the bootstrap. So what is good bootstrap for in this case? Uh, if I hadn't done any bootstrap, my predictions, these are the results we have obtained for the sandstorms. My predictions will be this red line and that will be it. But because I'm doing bootstrap, I realized that particularly in the sudden changes, 
that happened here, as expected, my algorithm is producing results that are, have more variance. And I can estimate this variance doing bootstrapping. Whereas if I hadn't done bootstrapping, I would just see this red line and that's it. Okay. So for example, here you see that the bands, the error bands are bigger in the regions where we have a, a more discrepancy between the model. This is the data minus model and the actual data as it should be. So it's, it makes sense. It's doing what it should be doing, the, the bootstrap. And it's giving me at least a sense of the error bar over here. And when you look into the zooming in and you look into regions of lots of sudden changes in my time variable, I find that indeed the bootstrap is doing the envelope is bigger where it should be. Uh, I'm telling you this because we also did lots of more, more complicated stuff using, for example, bootstrap, uh, sorry, uh, dropout, and we didn't get this nice behavior. So bootstrap is, again, something nice because you can always do, you can always estimate your uncertainties this way. We can bootstrap 200 times, a million times if you want, and you know we, you will find something that is very robust in general. That's at least my experience. Okay, so if there are no... More questions about Bootstrap? Um, we move on a bit. And now I want to tell you about uh, things beyond LSTMs. So of course, these LSTMs are not the only uh, way to do time series. As you can imagine, once you start using neural networks, there are many more architectures that you can start thinking about. Again, um, from the recurrent neural networks, we went into a new gated recursive unit uh, that have gates that allow us to pass forward information. That's what we saw last time. And based on uh, complexification of gated recurrent unit networks, we ended up with the LSTMs, the long, long short memory. And there are many architectures that you could use for time series. In particular, you can use CNNs, you can use graph neural networks, which I know you have been using and so on. You can do all kinds of uh, more complex things. Uh, and I'm going to be telling you about uh, convolutional neural networks uh, and the use also of CNNs for time series in a second. But the bottom line, uh, at least in my experience, is that uh, LSTMs are fast to run. Their performance tends to be very good. And when you complexify LSTMs by, for example, using CNNs on top of LSTMs, you use attention and so on, for a well-behaved time series, you don't gain much. So for example, here I have a comparison uh, for a complicated uh, problem, which is to try to predict the spatial and temporal behavior of traffic in the city of uh, Seattle. This is a study over here. So it's knowing where there is traffic and when there is traffic, no? And these people did all kinds of things. Arima is rather crap. And then they go into more complicated stuff, including something with graph neural networks and convolutional STMs and so on. Uh, this is for this case, you see that the after complexifying, you get this RMC, these error bars. Uh, the straightforward LSTM is pretty close. Uh, so it's, it's, it's true. The, depending on your problem, you may end up uh, squeezing uh, drops, few drops, and you, especially the experimentalists, I know you care about this. Uh, so trying different architectures different parameters, different ways of looking at the data is important, but a straight ahead LSTM usually works <laughs> uh, with good performance, okay? But uh, it might well be the case that for your problem, LSTMs are good, but you want to do better. And in particular physics, we tend to want to do better and we care about a 5% uh, improvement. So let me tell you about other architectures the first architecture I want to tell you about is called conv convolutional um, LSTM. And uh, what is this used for usually? 
is simply, for example, the typical example to use convolutional stems is you have a video um, of something happening, let's say somebody running. So the video, you, you can play it, but essentially a video is just a set of images, some frames per second that you are showing, and then the human eye cannot distinguish that it's not continuous, but it's actually something that it has time steps. So the first image of the video, second image, and so on. Right, so you have this kind of, it's at actually a time series as you can imagine. So for this is a time series whose input, the X themselves are images. They are two dimensional images. So we would like to use uh, two dimensional inputs to predict what's gonna happen in that video later. Or for example, or we want to not just predict or instead of predicting what is the next step in my video, I want to uh, classify the activity that I see in the video. For example, by showing examples of people running, I want to get a classifier that says running. For that, you will use an LSTM. And convolutional LSTM is simply an LSTM where the inputs are, <laughs> are images. So it's exactly the same structure we have been seeing, the same uh, units were with the same cell memory, the same activation, but now the X over here is a two-dimensional thing. So XT is going to be a two-dimensional thing. And what you are going to do before passing this information to the LSTM unit, you are going to do convolution on this, on this uh, image. And then what you will do is to flatten this image into an array. And that array is the X that you will input into the LSTM. And you do it for each of them and you run an LSTM uh, in the same way you do. Instead of being one dimensional, it's multidimensional and this multidimension is this array. Do, do I hear a question? No? So for example, you could think on this as an application. I don't think it, this has been done, but in particle physics, when you see the events as they are evolving inside the, the, the steady collider and you see it happening at each um, part of the detector and you have some, some time stamp, uh, stamp sorry, of, the, of each of these situations, you could try to uh, train an LSTM with these images, at this time series of these images of the different steps inside the collider. I don't know, I'm just saying rubbish. I don't know if anyone has done this, but for example, to do a better um, lonely particle analysis and whatever. And the, if you wanted to do this, the structure to do it will be convolutional LSTMs. Okay. So that's one example of uh, going beyond just a simple multidimensional LSTM is, uh, even if it's multidimensional, if X is an array, if it comes from an image, the first thing you will do is to pre-process it using convolution and um, pooling and so on. Okay. So another competitor that appeared to LSTMs very early on were actually your CNNs. I'm sure everybody here knows about convolutional neural networks. As you know, they, they are really good with images simply because what they do is to take, for example, an image that is 2D and it's going to transform it uh, using a, a convolution and a pooling, right? This kind of transformations uh, is good for images because this convolution and pooling um, preserves the locality of your image, right? So it preserves the relative positions inside your image. So CNNs can be used also to predict time series because uh, if you think on a time series of, let's say I have my one, that, let's start with our dimensional time series as some values of T and some values of my variable, the, my, for example, magnetic field, you can think on this as an array, one dimensional array of points, order points, where here, or what I'm putting is the value of B at T1, 
B a T2. And that's indeed what I'm inputting in the LSTM. But uh, one dimensional arrays, uh, there are arrays uh, where you actually care about the relative distances here, the same as convolution do does. So you can take a one dimensional time series, you put it as a one dimensional array, and you think on this as something where I'm going to do convolution in one dimension. So I can actually input this in the usual structure of a CNN, where I have layers of convolution of one dimension and also pooling. And I can end up with some kind of uh, dense at the end to produce my predictions. In the same way you will do with a two-dimensional or three-dimensional image, okay? So here the idea is that instead of using LSTMs, we could use CNNs, but one-dimensional, and run exactly the same neural network as we did for images, uh, but for time series, where we understand the time series as a kind of one-dimensional image where the relative distances are important. The thing is the CNNs um, perform very similar to LSTMs, and in some situations, you could do even better. So the CNNs you have been using, or well, computer vision, let's say, to, to do, for example, jet tagging or whatever you have been using, can be used for time series too. So what about if it's, instead of being a one-dimensional problem, you actually have a multi-dimensional problem, like, uh, for example, even in the sandstorms, I was telling you last time, we have many variables that are measured, uh, and then we want to predict a target variable, the variation of the magnetic field, for example. You can still use CNNs, of course. And for example, what you can do is to have one dimension that is time and simply stack up your other variables in a second dimension. So this is B, Z, this could be BY, BX, or whatever. And you can simply run a CNN with convolution two-dimensional. And of course, you probably are thinking, well, but the relative differences here in this dimension are, may, might not be meaningful, there's two, so you probably want to shuffle here and see how things change and so on. But essentially, that's the good thing about neural networks. As long as you work a tiny bit at the beginning, when you feed it, uh, it's going to work well. Uh, and as long as, for example, in the case of CNNs, you have something with a physical meaning, then it makes sense, convolutions do respect relative distances. It does contain this information somehow. Uh, if you expand it to do two-dimensional because you want to be multi-dimensional time series, it's going to work very well too. So that's, uh, you see the CNNs have been using for all kinds of tasks. You can still use them for time series and are going to work very well as well. So really like the performance, tends to be very similar. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, but then uh, in comparison with uh, this type of like stacking the information uh, to a 2D format, uh, I have a specific game with, uh, for example, time series in comparison if I, I just uh, do as a 1D. Is there some, some uh, specific mm -hmm. advantage? Yeah, very good. So um, let's say the idea is that in the simple examples I've given you in the notebook, we are, for example, looking at variation of one variable with time. We look at the past of this variable and we try to predict the future. And that's it. But even if you want to predict the future of some variable, let's say that I want to predict pollution. That's something I also do, no? I want to predict pollution. And I have the past of pollution, so some measurements of pollution in the past. That's a one-dimensional problem where I, knowing the, how it has been evolving the pollution in the last hours, I want to predict what's going to happen in the next few hours. That would be a fully, a simply, um, univariate uh, time series. But I know, for example, that the evolution of pollution will be influenced by temperature, uh, where it goes up and down, is day and night also, by wind as well. 
and by other variables that could appear as well. So I would like to implement this information, although I still want to produce uh, predictions for pollution in the future, I want to actually set up a problem where my inputs are not going to be just pollution in the past. I also want to put the temperature and the wind evolution in the past. So that's the second dimension here. So although I still want to produce predictions, so this guy is going to be pollution in the look forward time. As inputs, I'm going to put not just the pollution in the look back, but also all kinds of other variables, wind, temperature, and so on. And in the case of the CNN, the way I will input it is, for example, using this two-dimensional matrix. Uh, I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, I, I think so. But uh, what I was thinking is that I can do the same thing in 1D uh, uh, structure data set. So uh, I was wondering if uh, like doing this with 2D uh, uh, is some tricky uh, manner mm -hmm. and concatenate or relate the information in a specific way that is interesting for my data set. As you said, like mm -hmm. for example, wind and pollution, uh, uh, pollution, you could do the 2D data set like in, in such a manner that uh, could show you some specific information that you're looking for. Mm. I yeah. and now mm, I get your your question now. Sorry. So you're saying if I understand correctly, is instead of doing two D, I could simply put as an input a one D where I have let's say pollution in the past in my look back. I could also have temperature and I could have the variable of uh, wind. No. Mm -hmm. And is there any gain of uh, like could I do this and uh, put this as one D? Uh, do my convolution pulling, and that, that I know then that at least inside here, the convolution will take care of uh, the local relations, locality, locality. Okay, that's true. But it, it probably, sincerely, it will work very well. But if you do in 2D, as I'm saying, you are going to have that the 1D is the same time, so it's the same look back, and the three variables are actually related to each other because if this is uh, pollution, this is temperature and this is wind, the local relations in this other direction will be preserved as well. So the pollution at this time, the wind and temperature at this time will all be close to each other. So the, intuitively you would say putting it in this format will help the neural network to learn the relations better. But it, Sincerely, probably you do this, you will still get a good prediction. <laughs> so um, it's good to think about the way you input the information, and sometimes you get surprises. But uh, with lots of data and uh, deep networks like the ones we used to do, there is enough time and enough parameters to learn all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I get you now. So yeah, you could use a one dimensional, and I will still think that. Doing two dimensional, there could be some gain. Thank you. Welcome. Cool. Um, so, so CNNs perform very well, and of course, uh, as soon as people realize that uh, you could use uh, the CNN properties, the convolution of the locality in time and also locality in the space, for example, you will get but or you could get good results without the need of doing all this gated the units and so on, then people started using CNNs. And then, of course, as soon as this happened, you started getting all kinds of hybrid uh, methods where you, for example, typically start with a CNN a set of layers, then you run an LSTM to end up with a dense to produce the, the predictions. And uh, you will get in again a few more drops. And the reason is that CNN was able to take your time series. And if you think on CNNs, all what they are doing is to take your complicated image and transforming it into something simpler by convolution and pooling uh, that still keeps the, the important information. So 
you could think on this first layer CNN as a way of extracting or reducing the data into something more fundamental. And then you can run your LSTM on this pre-processed pre data through the CNN to produce better predictions. And indeed, you know, when people test uh, these hybrid methods, they do, do perform better in general than only CNN or only LSTM. Um, okay, so uh, the, you know, there is also for some problems, for example, especially in language, you want to use attention. We talk about attention uh, in the last lecture. Essentially, attention is a kind of uh, boosted. Uh, <laughs> A memory cell, but whereas in the LSTN, the memory cell T minus one will go to T through some decision. And this decision will be some mixture of I keep part of it and I get rid of part of this information in the memory cell. Uh, what attention does is simply without any kind of uh, reduction, it makes sure that information is passed along so that some stuff that happens at the very beginning in your time series may end up being propagating at the end of the time series where you may end up producing the prediction, for example, of sentiment. And I was telling you, let's say, if I want to take a sentence and I want to predict the sentiment, uh, if in uh, somewhere at the beginning of the sentence uh, and think about human language as quite complicated, there is a very negative word if I just used the memory cell, it could be that it gets diluted and lost in the middle in all these paths, whereas attention makes sure that it goes where it should go. So it's that, uh, again, it's more uh, um, elements, trainable parameters that you can have to account for uh, patterns that you want to keep. For example, the fact that uh, your human language now Think on your examples of ChatGPT. ChatGPT is producing sentences that make sense that are super long. And through this process, we could be losing important information at the beginning of the sentence simply because we place the prediction at the very end of that, uh, that series. Okay, so that uh, should be it for in terms of different architectures. Again, the good thing about uh, uh, this stuff of deep learning in general is we have data, we know how to deal with it. And uh, every one of these possibilities, the different architectures, optimization, and so on, they are your, at your fingertips, right? You can always code this. It's calling some land libraries. Uh, if the time series is very long, you will probably have to send a job somewhere to run it remotely. But this can be done, they can be tested. It's all, you don't have to like you had to do at the beginning, I don't know, to, to program back propagation by hand or stuff like this. There are libraries that are very simple to use, very flexible and so on. So knowing that there are different options you can test for your time series, for example, hybrids, this is something that once you know it, you can do it. Okay. So let me, we only have 10 minutes. So I want to tell you uh, about another example. Uh, so you get a feeling of the kinds of things that you can do with time series. Uh, we have been talking about these sandstorms uh, and what you can do in order to do est error estimation. Another project uh, we, we have been doing is, for example, another time series in this case is traffic uh, inside the city of Valencia. This is my city, my home city, <laughs> Valencia. And um, the city has placed sensors that uh, are able to see uh, when a car crosses and also to estimate the velocity. They also have information about what is the typical um, uh, type of vehicle that appears in the city, the kind of emissions they are, they are doing at uh, the velocity they go and so on. So there is a way of going from measurement, for example, of flux of traffic to uh, emissions, pollution. And since, at least in the cities, the main polluter by, let's say, 75%, 80% is uh, traffic, knowing the evolution of traffic allows us to uh, place a map of pollution along the city uh, to see where are the regions that are more congested and so on. So let's say this is the city. 
These are the different roads and the blue lines are the places where we have sensors and information about the traffic flags. So for example, if you think about the traffic flags, you see that uh, in um, key hours, for example, in the morning when people go to work or when they come back to work, I don't know, Spanish people, they come back to work super late. I don't know why. Uh, you see that the, there are all these main avenues, those are long roads or very broad roads that are get very congested, lots of traffic inside. Whereas in the city center, because of velocity restrictions, things are much better. And in the outskirts, because nobody lives there, so things are much better. So the colors represent uh, the traffic flags. So the idea is that we have data from many years or since this has been installed of the traffic flags. And we like to uh, predict, given a situation, look back, where is the look forward? It, for many reasons, for example, uh, one of the reasons we want to do this is because we do want to do actions. Uh, we want to intervene in the traffic, for example, closing some roads or diverting uh, traffic so that these the people living along these uh, main roads don't get too much pollution. Or we want to prevent congestion and so on to make uh, the whole uh, traffic more fluid. Or also, uh, particularly now, because we are going to have a stricter rules from the European Union in terms of the amount of pollution we can do, like uh, uh, starting from next year, I think whenever the pollution at some point in the city goes above some threshold and they have lowered the threshold a lot, the cities will get fined a bunch of money. Okay, so there is this increased interest <laughs> to know where in the city we are going to have levels of pollution that are above that threshold. Um, the problem with the city of Valencia is um, on purpose or not, they we have all this info about traffic, but we have only three places where we detect the pollution. And they are all located near big gardens. I don't know why. <laughs> so the idea is to use traffic as a proxy to actually estimate pollution and get a map of pollution everywhere in the city. So this is um, using this kind of uh, data. Uh, this is the kind of uh, predictions we are getting. Again, once you train it well and with enough data, you see that you can actually produce good a good estimate or even the peaks. This is, of course, like a day by day, but we have data every 10 minutes and so on. So the predictions are pretty good. And on top of that, uh, at least in near one of these stations where you get real measurements of pollution, you can correlate the traffic flags that is going through this road with the pollution. So the reason I'm telling you all this, apart from you see that time series can be used in many ways, is because um, here the problem that we are facing is we have a time series that is traffic, but actually we would like to learn about another time series, which is pollution. And, and the first question you can ask yourself is, uh, those are two different time series, are, corre are they correlated to each other? And if they are correlated, uh, the, is there any time lag between the two time series? Because it could be that traffic increases, the pollution increases, but it takes some time until you actually see that effect. So you want to know about the lag between the two time series. Uh, in our case, this is the correlation between traffic and pollution in this particular situation. You see things that are close to one means that they are very correlated. And here is the time of offset. And in our case, the pollution and the traffic have no offset. So you get the best correlation between the two time series precisely at the same moment. So an increase in traffic will produce an almost immediate increase in pollution. Meaning that we, we predict traffic, we predict pollution uh, with no delay. But this is not the case in general. For example, in the notebook that I'm giving you, uh, for example, for the case of um, the magnetic field, 
we have correlated variables, it's a multi multidimensional problem, and we see that there is actually quite a, sorry, I put out some um, uh, code. Sorry, I should say that I'm really bad at coding. So I'm sure you guys code so much better than me and anybody else I know. And uh, I should be ashamed of the way I code, but I don't. And I just telling you that you could probably improve in the way I'm coding here. But essentially, we can evaluate for a two time series. We can evaluate the Pearson correlation, which is these values we see here. When we evaluate the correlation, we are doing in two time series at the same t, at the same moment. So when things are very correlated, they are correlated at the same moment. But it could be that two variables are very correlated, but only if you shift them, because one is the a consequence of the other. So in this case, you see the differences between these two lines, and you see that the shift is very small. And if you will start playing with the parameters here, you will see that this shift will move around a bit. So it's really like all the variables we are looking at in the case of the sandstorms, they are very highly correlated and in the same time frame. So there is no offset. Whereas uh, here I added, oh, sorry, it's almost 10.30. We'll talk about this later, but I added uh, another time uh, series looking at the at Tesla, the company, looking at the price of their uh, shares, the, the stock price, as it changes with time. As, as you can imagine, Tesla goes up and down a lot because it's, it's around $300 per, per, per share, and it goes down to 100, then goes up. So it's a pretty shaky kind of thingy. And um, you can run a, a simple LSTM, and you will end up with a very good prediction. And in fact, uh, you will get something uh, here just doing notebook that I share with you. Zooms that show that actually you are doing pretty good. Uh, and your let's say in the three hundred dollars or so of uh, price of the of the shares, your typical error bar in predicting the next value is seven dollars. So your this time series is easy enough to to predict. So maybe I'll leave this for tomorrow. But tomorrow I'm going to be telling you about natural language processing, embeddings, transformers, and so on. Mm -hmm. And to connect it with time series, we will do. Uh, something related to Twitter and the Twitter sentiment that is felt on Tesla. And what we are going to see is that the same story I was telling you about, the offset between the time series, the sentiment about Tesla uh, as you know, voiced in Twitter and the values of their shares, uh, they are correlated, not a lot, but order 40% correlated, uh, but there is an offset and the offset is about a month uh, so the Twitter sentiment that goes uh, very negative a month before tends to influence the value of the shares later. But this we will talk about this tomorrow. I, will, I, I need to stop now. Okay, any questions? I have one question. Sure. Oh, it's great. Um... I was wondering also like uh, about the banner, pattern of the time ser the series uh, in related in relation to the training time. Since you showed us uh, the star data set and the traffic data set, and you discussed a little bit about the delay between the two during uh, after uh, a time of training, and then you have to uh, train again to uh, get more, better like the real prediction uh, fit. So mm -hmm. about this because the storm looks uh, good, but it's too uh, it seems a more complicated uh, time series than the the traffic one. So I was wondering how the the training time and training mm -hmm. time uh, uh, has some cooperation and how it's it's compared since they have these patterns uh, more complex patterns in the time series. That's a very good question. So yes, uh, you start training your STM, and as I told you, it's not like uh, CNN's typical training where you do I don't know 200 epochs and you are done, uh, or a fully connected 200 epochs and you are done. You actually need to train for thousands of epochs in general to actually capture the whole thing. And if you stop early on, what you are going to find is indeed there is a shift because it's actually not learning. 
And you might be full thinking you are doing super well because your error bars are, your error bars, your RMSE, your overall picture is good, but simply because uh, it's, it's learned to predict the previous step. So the question is how do you, so knowing that you had to train for a long time, you do a thousand, you do 2000, when do you stop training? And uh, one possibility, for example, let me go here. Uh, uh, is to, you, when you train, you are going to have a training and you are going to have a, a validation data set. And what you can do with the validation data set is to evaluate the performance of your training or your, or your simulation as you go to higher, sorry, and higher uh, values of your training. And at some point, all what it had to learn, it will be learned. So this is the plot to show you over here. This is for data, a data set that was less good. So we didn't have so much of data. It was only hourly. The training was not as good as what I'm showing you. And when we were plotting the loss um, with the epochs, we will see that the training was plateauing, but also the validation loss was plateauing and this gap was maintained. Mm -hmm. Same way that you do with the usual fully connected, you evaluate how your per accuracy for your training and validation uh, keep a gap. And if at some point they, they don't uh, converge together, it's just stop training because there is no point. You are hyper specializing on your training and not gaining any kind of reproducibility, right? So you can do exactly the same for LSTMs or any time series. You can train and train and train and you see when you, at, at some point, the, you see the gap is large and then it becomes smaller and smaller, but at some point, it's not getting any better. And it means that there is no point of keeping training. Um, and yes, it could be that because your data is not great, uh, you will never reach a good accuracy and you will end up always with some time delay like this, but uh, no matter how much you train. And that's why you keep, you should keep an eye on this. You should uh, zoom, see if this is indeed what is happening. Um, in particular, you should compare your predictions with a baseline where your prediction is going to be the last step. And if you're not doing better than that, uh, it's really not, you're not learning. Uh, you could just well predict the last step. And this is not uh, directly due to the fact that of the time series uh, be more complex, like uh, more readily or not, right? It's, it's about the data set that you have. Yes, exactly. So uh, of course it is like everything you have, um, you you're, you don't have enough flexibility in your neural network. Uh, it's not able to capture all the possible trends that there is in data. Um, but if you start giving too much flexibility, you are going to be overfitting. And that's why you need to plot something like this always. Um, and you don't want that either. And it, oh, even on top of that, if you do your best in terms of your training of your algorithm and checking with your validation, you might end, end up with this kind of situation where with a baseline, where you just uh, predicting the last step, the last seeing point, you might not do better than that. Uh, and that will mean that uh, no matter what you do, and you can do hybrid, and you can add CNS, and you can add attention, and you will squeeze always a bit uh, more in these predictions, but you may end up not learning your time series. I must tell you, here we went from hourly data, uh, and in hourly data, we already had a better performance than what I'm showing. This is an extreme case where we, we do an early stopping with but with hourly data, you could get something relatively good with no delay, but we were missing the peaks. Mm -hmm. with, with 10 minutes data, more granularity, we were actually picking up the peaks correctly. The, the traffic flags, when there are sudden changes, we were able to train properly. So yeah, it's, a, it's an art, like everything you do. Uh, and but it, to have baselines to compare with and that, I would say it's a baseline, always compare with the last step. Uh, because you, and, they, and again, you can get a super good, you think it's a good performance and you could have not run any algorithm and just predict the last step, right? So keep an eye on these kind of things because it's super typical. 
this kind of thing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Any more questions? Again, you can ask questions by Slack. I will answer them. And tomorrow we will be looking at uh, more natural language processing. Um, if we have time, I will also tell you about more, since the title was more fun stuff with, uh, more fun with machine learning, I, I have other interesting things that you could do beyond particle physics, just using the same techniques. Let's see if we have time for that, like uh, talking about art, or ecology or uh, earthquakes and so on. Um, but if not, we will just uh, continue talking about sequential data and talking about language, a uh, human language. Okay. Uh, so see you tomorrow. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, let's have a coffee break and uh, then we continue with my goal. Thanks for having me.